Hey everyone, I'm doing a rare gaming video on the channel today, so sit back as I play Townscaper and do my best to ruin it using the tactics of Robert Moses. Let's get into it. So I've already gone ahead and built a town. And the idea here is to basically take a charming European village, the kind that Townscaper can recreate pretty well and see what happens if we subject it to, you know, about a century of failed American urban planning practices, uh, some of which is typified by Robert Moses, the uh, great builder of New York City, which we'll talk more about him throughout the video. But this is the this is what I've created as sort of a starting point here. So I've created a what I think is a pretty charming European style village, the kind of kind of thing that Townscaper is pretty great at recreating uh, with a pretty uh, substantial hinterlands here that we're going to fill up in this video. So for those who don't know, Townscaper is a great tool for having fun building cities. It's, again, sort of pre-made to build the kind of urbanism that you would see in a charming European village. You can see here, you can pop uh, buildings together and it just sort of creates things automatically. It's like sort of, uh, sort of a nice way of building uh, without having to think much about it. And you can just do cool designs and uh, it's really fun. So uh, I'll just leave this building here. It's a nice little, I don't know, church building on the outside of town here. But you can see here, I've already created a little town here. Uh, there is a, you know, church at the center, um, you know, with a little square in front of it. You have narrow streets. You got some backyards here, you know, some in the center of the blocks. Maybe like a market uh, uh, area right here and uh, a waterfront with some, some docks here. You know, I kind of modeled this uh, greenish building after the ferry building in, uh, San Francisco. So you can see sort of like right up against the, the water here. Maybe this is like a kind of a castle or something. I don't know. Uh, but it's all in all, I think, you know, again, a very charming looking little town. Um, and then I went ahead and I created some, some farms here. So you can see, uh, you know, got the, the red barn, a little silo and a, a farmhouse. Same thing over here, here. And I also created some little villages on the outskirts here. So, you know, cute, uh, cute buildings. So for those who don't know, uh, who might be new to Townscaper, there's a few little uh, sort of tricks of Townscaper. And one of which is if you completely encircle an area, uh, you create an area of green space. So uh, this uh, hinterlands here, which I've maxed out, it's as far out as it can go, um, has uh, a wall around it to create a green space. So we have sort of the, the dense city here, and then we have the sort of peripheral green space around it. So for the for the purposes of this simulation, uh, we're going to be starting in the 1920s, 1930s. This is when uh, U.S. suburbanization really started kicking off. This is also when Robert Moses came onto the scene in New York City uh, and became sort of the master builder that he is known for. So one thing I want to do here is uh, start expanding the city. This is a small village here, or a small city that's ripe for growth and development. And, uh, you know, if this was in the United States at this time, they would be looking at growing out, not up. So uh, the 1920s and 1930s were the sort of the tail end of the streetcar suburb era in the United States, and it was starting to become sort of the, the, the introduction of the automobile suburb. Now, we sort of think about, um, I'm gonna change the color. Well, should I go bland here? I don't know. <laughs> this might be too bland, these houses. <laughs> let's, let's do something a little bit more colorful, uh, like some yellow houses. So, uh, you know, we saw at the end of the streetcar suburb era and, and this era of the automobile, the idea that we'd want to grow out. Um, cities were seen as sort of dangerous, dark, dirty, all the bad Ds. Um, and they wanted, people wanted to live outside of the city. So uh, what they did was start building houses outside. And, and we sort of associate that with the post-war era after World War II, but really this this pattern picked up pretty early and it was actually promoted by the federal government. Um, the idea that we would, you know, would have home ownership, these sort of neighborhoods, um, you know, out on the edge. Uh, they're seeing as sort of safer investments for new housing, things like that. So what I'm doing right now is I am sort of building what we would call now inner ring suburbs. So these suburbs were some of the, the earliest suburbs. They had the smallest houses that you'll find just about anywhere in the United States uh, for the suburbs. This was back when uh, you know a new house was eight or 900 square feet. Sorry about the lack of metric conversion. I'm filming this without a script, uh, but maybe I'll put it on screen. Um, so you had the, some of the smallest houses. So house sizes in the United States uh, grew, uh, oh, this is a big house. 
uh, grew uh, over time. And now the average size of a new new house in terms of square footage is something like 2,800 square feet or 2,700 square feet. But back in the early days, you know, from the 1920s to the 1950s, it was really about 900 square feet. So we're building pretty much the smallest single family detached houses we can we can get here. And I built a little neighborhood of, of you know, kind of cottages here, which, you know, I think the challenge of this challenge is going to be uh, making uh, anything look ugly in Townscaper because it's such a beautiful, uh, such a beautiful thing. So I built my first little subdivision here of yellow houses all in a row. Um, I also want to be thinking about here, um, you know, we have sort of regional planning to consider here. So we have a village over here, a village up on the top, and, and another village here. And I was thinking, well, you know, uh, as we sort of plan out our regional routes, we might want to be thinking about uh, where they go. And I think the answer here is that I want you know, sort of roads connecting to these villages, which might sort of grow with time as well. So um, let's let's plan that and keep that in mind as well. So as so as we do that, so there might be you know sort of a bigger road here potentially. I also have to start thinking, uh, you know, to tip my hand a little bit here that we're going to be adding uh, highways to this. So where where might highways go? But you know, uh, in the spirit of this game, we can just destroy uh, highways if we or destroy houses with highways if we want. Um, okay, so we're going to build some more here. I'm just going to be build, building a lot of entering suburbs here for a second um, and talk about suburbia. So like I said, uh, post-war is when the suburbs really got started uh, going crazy. Oh, I just destroyed that nice little path created there. Um, and you can learn more about that. I actually published a video recently about it, um, all about Levittown, which was sort of one of the first sort of mass-produced suburbs in the United States or the, the folks who figure out how to do it best best of all if best by best you mean sort of most affordable and like most uh, factory like uh, okay so we got ourselves a little orange a little orange neighborhood here a yellow one over there and an orange one here it's looking pretty good I mean townscaper again it's so charming they do such a great job of auto generating these like fences and bushes and things but we got ourselves another entering suburb I'm gonna do another one here before we move on and have a reddish color maybe. So I'm thinking here, we need to um, sort of have room here. Maybe, maybe we'll tuck one right here. So we've got some of these entering suburbs. Now, again, entering suburbs, they're sort of fascinating today because they're one of the few places where you can find affordable housing in the suburbs. Um, in a lot of these houses, because they are 60, 70, 80 years old now, um, they're a little run down potentially. Um, but they can be sort of great deals if you're willing to put in some effort to, to rebuild them or sort of refurbish them. Okay, so we got ourselves this. I wish we could do like more streets in this simulation, but we're gonna do the best we can do. Okay, so we got, we have some entering suburbs here. So the city's starting to grow uh, already. Uh, starting to feel a little bit more American. Now, one thing that's important to understand is that um, you can't really talk about U.S. urban development over the last hundred years without talking about inequality, and we'll keep it to in income inequality for this video. Um, so, uh, it's important to know that in this community, um, that not all incomes are created equal, and that the the lower income area is this part of town right here. So you can see that the the houses are, are, are a little smaller, they're single story, and they're all sort of crowded together here. So this is our low income neighborhood. Uh, it's gonna be important to know. Uh, higher income neighborhoods have, have some of the you know, two story townhouse, townhomes, and they're much nicer over here. So low income neighborhoods over here, all right? So I would say this puts us, um, you know, we're sort of getting close to, I don't know, the 1940s, early 1950s. Now at this point in the United States, I'm gonna add another suburb while we're talking here. At this point in the United States, uh, states have really begun to experiment uh, with freeway construction. Notably places like, Cal oops, I delete that. Notably places like California, uh, who began designing limited access freeways as early as you know the 1920s. And uh, by the 1930s, even places like New York City were experimenting with uh, limited access uh, highways. In fact, Robert Moses was one of the first folks to do this. Uh, he was uh, a parks commissioner and built some parkways that had limited access that essentially reminded us of uh, freeways today. Okay, so got another 
neighborhood here. But what I'm saying here is that uh, once we start developing outside of the city limits, we're gonna start needing uh, freeways. So the idea here is that we need to bring in people living on the outskirts uh, using some sort of faster moving uh, apparatus to get cars in uh, faster. So um, let's start thinking about how we're going to plan this out. Now, I mentioned that this is sort of the lower income area. Um, so that's something to be helpful to be thinking about. So by and large in the United States, freeways are punched through low income areas. Um, so uh, there are reasons for this. OK, let's see if I can do this now. This is going to be a challenge. This is where I kind of want. So there's this nice little gate here, and this, I created this little spot here, but I don't know if this is the right spot. I'm again, I might have to, I'm going to delete this house or <laughs> demolish these houses just to give myself a little bit more room. Freeways take up a lot of space. <laughs> I'll make sure I get this right. I want to do it in sort of a, a grayish, I think, and we're going to make these elevated freeways. Um, so I'm going to go up and then go like this and then like this and then okay. So we're going to. Kind of go like this. Eventually here, the roofs are going to go away. Uh, I might have to do this. Yeah, OK. The roofs go away. So this is our freeway. I think it's pretty convincing. <laughs> I think that looks like a, a, you know, an elevated freeway. I know they don't normally have windows. I think it's the best we're going to do in Townscaper. Um, and I'm going to do my best to try to weave it through these houses. But there's going to be some collateral damage here, I think. <laughs> Sorry, houses. Sorry, houses. OK. The tricky thing about Townscaper is that it's actually, <laughs> there's no such thing as a right angle here in Townscaper, um, which makes me trying to like thread this needle quite difficult. And you know these highways are going to be kind of ugly. I might need to fix it later. I definitely will try to fix it later. OK. So we're going in. OK, yeah, this is a problem. <laughs> so the problem is if I touch the wall here, it like messes with the green space. And I don't want the star piece. OK. So we may have to just sort of pretend um, that it cuts through. I don't know. We'll see. OK, but I'm going to do this. We're going we're gonna to continue it here and see if we can't make the connection later. But OK. OK, cool. We got ourselves the start of an urban freeway. So it's got to pretend that it cuts in there. We, I don't know if we can make it touch. OK, and we'll make, the, we'll make this better. This is, this is garbage right now. OK, so a couple things. First of all, uh, cities were not afraid of going through low-income neighborhoods. They mostly did this because uh, you know, the, they'll tell you that land is cheaper there, right? So they want to be good, good citizen, a good taxpayer. Uh, you know, what am I trying to say? They're, they're good with taxpayer dollars. They're very uh, frugal, right? Uh, so if you buy uh, low-income land, uh, it's cheaper, right? Uh, if you sort of force people to leave through eminent domain, it's cheaper if you do it in a low-income area than in a higher-income area. So that's what they did. Now, of course, uh, they had ulterior motives here, I think, as well, that low-income neighborhoods are less likely to protest uh, this change uh, or this demolition. Um, so it was much easier. There's a lot more political capital in the, in the higher-income neighborhoods. OK, so we're going to take these down, too. So thus begins our first sort of demolition of our, of our beautiful little village here. OK, and we're going to take this down, too. So we're cutting through this low-income neighborhood. And what you'll notice, too, is like you, you've noticed this anywhere you've, you've seen uh, freeways go through. That like it's not just the freeway; it's everything around the freeway just really gets devalued, right? Like, it's a uh, it's not a pretty sight to see a freeway going through, and nobody wants to live near uh, a freeway either for all sorts of good reasons. Um, the the amount of pollution coming off of a freeway is crazy, and not just in terms of like carbon emissions, which is substantial, but also uh, source of particulates uh, like brake dust, things like that. It's just terrible for you. Um, so not good to live near a freeway. OK, one challenging thing here is we're getting darn close to this church. And uh, uh, you know we're assuming that this church here is a, a nice church, as in like one that serves wealthy residents. We probably should avoid it. If this was a church serving a low-income community or an, a certain ethnic group, 
uh, would not matter one bit to, to many uh, highway planners of the historical times. They would tear down a church, no problem. Uh, but we're going to keep this church. So let's try to like, this is the challenge of Townscaper. I want to move you this way a little bit. <laughs> okay, so you're watching a novice do this. I'm not like the greatest Townscaper person, but we're trying our best. Okay, and what I want to do actually ultimately here is punch through to the waterfront. Because, uh, you know, after destroying a low-income community, there's nothing highway planners like to do more than to completely separate a community from its waterfront. Um, so we're going to do that right now. <laughs> uh, waterfronts were sort of, again, seen as cheaper options. They're often not built on. They might have been a floodplain, um, you know, something like that. But they were seen as places where you could pretty much build a freeway pretty easily uh, without getting a lot of resistance, um, of course. You know, now we sort of like our waterfronts and want to reclaim our waterfronts, but, um, you know, back then I guess it was seen as sort of an, the expedient choice in the name of progress for the automobile. Okay, so we're moving through here. We're, we're cruising to the waterfront. Okay, and let's do it. Let's cut back this way now. Okay, so we're along the waterfront. So I just want to take a look at our. We have successfully just cut a real nice scar through this low-income community. There's some people left over here, um, and there are even a few people left over here. Like this is like probably the, these are probably the three saddest houses in town, uh, and we completely separated this neighborhood, uh, just destroying probably all social cohesion. Uh, you know, it's oh dear, um, you know, it's it's a much sadder place than it was before. Okay, I'm getting a little too close to these buildings here. Let me see if I can turn this thing around a little bit. Okay. Yeah, this is nice. Okay. So, so what am I doing now? Uh, not only am I building a highway along the, the waterfront here, I'm destroying the property values of people right along the waterfront. Uh, what was once a really charming spot uh, is now completely um, blacked out by a freeway. Okay. So we're getting to another tight spot here. How am I going to bring this around? Uh, I think some buildings will have to come down here, and it's going to be some of these charming buildings here. Now, uh, we're probably in the 1950s here. Uh, we're not going to hear a lot of public outcry. Uh, you know, some public outcry maybe, but we're not going to see the level of public outcry uh, that you're going to see in the 1960s, 1970s when preservation movements in the United States kick off, when you sort of see people actually caring about how you know, the, the fate of old buildings. So now we've completely cut off a historic castle from the, the town center. Well done. Um, so, you know, what was once probably a really nice tourist attraction is still a tourist, att tourist attraction, but not nearly as sort of, you know, great as before. Now, we got to cut right through this town square too. So um, even in Europe, now we saw town squares in this time period uh, being turned into parking lots. Uh, though few are probably turned into just sort of active freeways. And we're just demolishing more historic structures here because I, I want to keep this ferry building up uh, while I can. Let's see. Yeah. Yes. Nope. Too close. I want to keep the roof structure. Like, uh, Townscaper gets really touchy about that kind of stuff. And these. So can we go like this? Yep. Yep. All right, we got some ugly freeway action. Maybe we can just assume some of these weird freeway things here are the uh, the on ramps and off ramps, which I'm not really building, but are a thing, uh, and they can really stick their tentacles out into a city and destroy it pretty pretty nicely as well. Okay, uh, another historic structure along the waterfront. We're just gonna make this go away too, or maybe just like badly maim it. Boom, boom. Robert Moses would be proud. So speaking of Robert Moses, while I'm doing this, uh, yeah. So he was. Uh, notable because in, from the, about the 1920s to the 1960s, he really positioned himself to, to maximize his political power in the construction of uh, of new infrastructure in uh, in uh, New York City. So he was on the he was sort of the chairman of several state commissions and local commissions like parks boards. Uh, he was uh, involved in the oh shoot okay wait. How did I do that? Did that fix it? Yeah, there's the greens back. Okay, sorry. Uh, you know, he was on boards and commissions, um, you know, a lot of places. So he um, 
upwards of 10, 12 different places at one time. So like he would be in charge of New York City's public housing, the bridges, tunnels, uh, parks, all sorts of things at the same time. So he really had unprecedented power uh, to essentially do what he wanted. And he did not care particularly about asking for, uh, ooh, that's, that's good. Did not particularly care about asking for feedback from people <laughs> like the community. Okay, look at that. Look at that. We got ourselves a freeway. Uh, this will help suburban commuters get into their day jobs. Um, you know, the idea here is that the, the, the central city is no longer a place for people to live. It's more of a place for people to, uh, to work. And then uh, they live uh, in these new suburbs. Okay, so let's see if I can continue it. Can I continue it this way without breaking? Okay, yes. So I built a little too close here. I'm going to have to destroy some of these little Cape Cods. Anyway, so Robert Moses, uh, he just built himself up a huge power base and you could essentially get anything built. And actually you'll see that some folks recently have been sort of rethinking Robert Moses's legacy a little bit because it's been so hard to build new infrastructure. Uh, and you know, a lot can be said about things Robert Moses did wrong, but one thing he did do was he built uh, infrastructure uh, that lasted a long time uh, and built uh, uh, he on budget. And he also built it uh, at all. The fact that he get things built and he did it on time under budget and built to last is sort of seen as like a, one of his positive legacies, uh, but his negative legacy, of course, being the fact that uh, he, um, you know, didn't really consider the public, had no problem just displacing people left and right, like we just saw. Okay, so back to this though. Um, so we've got a we've got a freeway now. Uh, one thing freeways did um, really well was it made it even easier for suburban residents to, um, you know, live farther out. There's a, a, a phrase, drive until you qualify in the United States, uh, which implies, there we go, we got the freeway hooked up there, uh, which implies that if you can't afford a house close by, just keep going uh, and you'll find a house uh, that you can't afford. Uh, because the, initially here, these places were considered to be, um, you know, a little bit pricier than living in the city. Um, and that, you know, maybe if you were farther out and your commute was a little longer, it'd be a little bit cheaper to live there. Um, so people would sort of just take the freeway out to wherever they can afford to buy a house. So we're going to keep building the freeway out here, get it to this first village here. All right. Keep going. All right. So we're just about there. So what we're gonna do now, I don't wanna, I don't think we're gonna punch it right through this, uh, right through this. What you see a lot of the times in, in as sort of cities uh, get added to um, the metro area via things like freeways, is you build a bypass, right? Uh, so what happens then, you got the bypass, and uh, which saves the community, uh, but uh, we're gonna do something where we're gonna build uh, our first shopping mall, okay? And uh, I'm gonna put it over here. So this is gonna be, we'll see if we can do this. I wish we could build parking lots in Townscapers. <laughs> I think I'm the only person on the planet who wishes they could build. Actually, I'm gonna do it once, I'm gonna do it one story. Well, we'll see. We'll see how we do this here. Okay, so I'm just gonna build a nice big old shopping mall. So. First shopping malls appeared on the scene in the United States in the 1950s. This guy, Victor Gruen, uh, was the sort of inventor of the shopping mall, uh, or sort of was the one who figured out some of the, the main components, the idea of having these sort of shops under a covered arcade, uh, you know, with things like a food court. Uh, I believe it was uh, in Minneapolis or the Twin Cities area that he built his first shopping mall. He actually ended up feeling so bad about it that he also invented the pedestrian mall, which is sort of like bringing the idea of the mall to, uh, to inner cities or to central cities. Uh, but of course they did not uh, survive. I have a whole video on that if you wanna watch. Okay, so we got ourselves a suburban shopping mall. Imagine uh, that there is, um, you know, parking around here. I can't really, can't really do that, but you know, people can now take the, the freeway to the shopping mall. You know, we're gonna call it, you know, something like Southdale Town Center because this town center just totally gets decimated. Like there's no, there's no real, uh, there's no real commercial development left 
uh, to speak of. All right, so another victim of the highway. So why don't we stop talking highway for a second? Look at that nice elevated freeway with this nice shopping mall. You know, I, I gotta add at least, right, a few sort of, you know, fast food places or something, right? Something, a mattress store, or whatever. You know, things that line the freeways here. Oops, all right, cool. A couple of those too. All right, we got some strip malls or something. Yes, we're starting to get this. So this this seems to be to be you know prime area. This guy, this farmer has held out for a long time, but you know he wants to retire, right? So we're gonna we're gonna take this down. That you know, now we got ourselves a nice uh, you know a nice uh, shopping center here. Not quite a Walmart just yet, but you know, and we'll get some diversity of how some housing choices here. Now we're in the we're in the fifties. You know, we get some we get some bigger houses mixed in here. So let's keep going here. Got, got ourselves another neighborhood around this. Now, okay. We don't want the houses too close. I mean, we do see houses close to a uh, close to freeways, but we do, I think, in this case, want to keep them. Uh, you know, more about um, commercial. You also see a lot of jobs around freeways. Um, actually, so uh, these are often job centers. You get like, uh, oh, I don't know, like, um, you know, like just sort of back office jobs, places, you know, that don't really need like a, a fancy uh, downtown address. Yeah, these are looking good. I'm really excited about this, guys. <laughs> this is looking, this is looking real nice. I think this is about as ugly as you can start making Townscaper. You know, this sort of thing right here. This is looking good. Okay, so we got ourselves. Maybe we get. Can we, get an, can we fit another one in here? Okay, look at that. Look at that. We got ourselves a mall. Okay, nice. Yes, yes. I'm liking this look. I, mean, I probably should start expanding over here too. Uh, and we probably need to go right through this farm. So the city's going to purchase, or the the regional agency is gonna purchase this farm here and just demolish it. Who needs who needs prime ag, ag land? And this is like a real problem, guys. Uh, cities all over the United States have paved right over prime agriculture land in the name of uh, suburban development. I mean, a lot of the reason that towns are where they are in the United States is because they were farming communities, right? They were places where people could go to the, to the local co-op you know, buy their seed, buy their, uh, you know, manure uh, stuff for their farm, uh, you know, and, and go drop off their stuff at the, at the depot. So uh, they're all, a lot, many of them are built in, on prime agricultural land, and then we just sort of immediately uh, turn into suburban lawns, which is really sort of tragic. All right, so we're building the freeway. God, these are ugly. I'm really not good at them, but I'm sort of liking just sort of this disjointed nature. It just isn't so uh, counter to what Townscaper <laughs> sort of wants you to do. These jagged, uh, oops, these, these jagged, uh, terrible looking uh, freeways. All right, so we gotta get to this town as well. So I take the freeway out here, just kinda punch this through. Just wants us to naturally curve in all these different ways. Oops. Okay. Well, let's do this. Okay, we're getting we're getting out here. So I think you know now that we have sort of these two arms of this freeway. What we do need to think about is a belt line. Um, you know, there's nothing. You know, there's. At this point, there are folks who, you know, live over here um, in this sort of green inner ring suburb that might want to work over at the mall or at least access the mall without having to go all the way through town, right? So you need to build a belt line to avoid to avoid the uh, city entirely. So let's do that. I'm gonna keep pushing through here. Let me know in the comments if you like this kind of video for me. I don't know. I got so interested in Townscaper uh, just because it's a fun game. Uh, and, you know, I, I obviously spent my requisite time building charming, you know, European-style urbanism. But I couldn't help but wonder 
if we could use this to talk about suburban development in the, in the United States and sort of our sort of strange policies oops, uh, that led to cities that nobody really, I don't know, that, that so we're sort of, as planners, we're sort of dealing with the fallout of many of these decisions. So around suburbanization and urban renewal, oh gosh, I'm too close. Okay. So yeah, I mean, just to talk about urban renewal for a second too. So that was uh, started in 1949 and uh, it went on to about 1973, if I'm gonna, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, and it was basically the federal government. Originally, there was a housing program, and we'll get we'll talk more about inner city housing in this video. Uh, but it was an idea of sort of providing, uh, so sort of doing slum clearance, so uh, dis destroying and displacing folks living in what the federal government declared to be slum conditions or overcrowded conditions, and, and housing them in newer housing developments, and then. Um, Eventually, it got expanded to sort of promoting commercial development as uh, central cities could not compete with suburban uh, commercial development, like this shopping mall here. So uh, that's what urban renewal is for. You know, it, uh, it's generally considered to be a negative in the city planning world. Um, because again, this was in the 1950s and 1960s when the idea that you might want to ask people what they think about this uh, was sort of foreign and planners just sort of did what they thought was best according to their uh, plans. And people like Jane Jacobs uh, became famous during this time in part because they um, stood up to this concept of sort of centralized planning. Oh, I have to demolish this. And, uh, you know, Jane Jacobs, she wrote a book called The Death and Life of Great American Cities, for those who don't know, and I'd recommend reading it. It's, it was written in 1961, but it really has a lot to say about how we plan cities today and its reaction to how we plan cities in the past, like this. Um, so worth reading. And she uh, actually went up against Robert Moses uh, to stop the Lower Manhattan Expressway through her neighborhood. So, uh, yeah, so she's sort of the foil to our Robert Moses here. But right now, Robert Moses is in full swing. Uh, Robert Moses helped us design this beltway. And now we need to really start filling in this beltway with uh, all sorts of tacky housing and, and strip commercial development. So let's get to it. Um, all right. So let's see here. Some more of this. I kind of have to design these sort of odd shapes because if I do a, a really nice shape, uh, Townscaper assumes that I want a nice roof on it, and I don't. I want them to be flat-roofed, cheap pieces of crap, like the kind you see in, along a highway. And success thus far with that. Yes. Okay. So we got some more uh, of that. Now let's build some more housing. Oh, no, you look too charming. There we go. There we go. Okay. Let's build some more small houses over here. Oh, too close. Okay. Let's see. So yes, urban renewal, uh, not considered a popular uh, program now. Um, and we switched to something called community development block grants, which are still a thing that exists today. And, and this, it's, it's a funding program for cities to do redevelopment, but it's, uh, you have to uh, show that you actually did outreach with the community and only funds certain things. So uh, it's not, you know, it's, it's not sort of a, a carte blanche to destroy neighborhoods and kind of completely rebuild uh, inner cities like uh, it happened during urban renewal. So that's a little bit more tactical. Okay, Ooh, nice, filled that in, liking that. Spilled some more, uh, some kind of crappy strip mall stuff over here too. They, got, they have to go to a strip mall too. Okay, yes, looking good. Some more houses as well. All right, cool. All right, so the inner ring is filled up. This is looking, this is looking great. And if by great, I mean terrible. Okay, so um, now that we've got our inner ring essentially done, I want to be thinking more about sort of the next level of, of suburban suburban development, which just really means let's basically double the size of our houses here. If those houses were you know 900 square feet, let's make these about 1,800 square feet. So we're gonna go, you know, double 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 wide if this was a trailer. No, uh, two, uh, two squares large here um, along this sort of inner ring here, or just outside the inner ring, I should say. And this is, yes, this is fantastic. Oh, I should, I, well, we should, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this neighborhood here, then I am gonna return to the inner city, because we're talking about urban renewal, and I feel like 
we need to do some inner urban renewal uh, to our actual central city. It's just too charming still. Uh, I don't like how charming it is when we could make it much worse. Okay, so this is a nice little subdivision here. Okay, got our subdivision over there. Let's come back, let's come back to this. So, uh, what has happened uh, in the time period since we've built this freeway? Well, property values have plummeted in much of the community. Also, uh, jobs uh, uh, and uh, shopping, housing has all moved to the suburbs. So this, uh, this community is in, in dire straits, right? So these are now slums. Uh, these, are, uh, these are over, uh, sort of more people live in them than, than should be living in them. Um, and this is, you know, a, a terrible situation. So what, what the government here is going to do is actually uh, demolish these. It's called slum clearance. So we're going to take out the uh, overcrowded uh, housing. But don't worry, we're going to build new public housing in its place. So the urban renewal started out, like I said, as a housing program. So we're going to build some housing uh, to house all these folks. And this is absolutely something uh, Robert Moses did in New York City. Uh, he was known for, uh, despite uh, trying to increase housing in, in, in New York City, demolishing nearly as much housing as he built. Um, and one can say that the, the housing that he built uh, was not really much of an improvement. Okay, so, oh, this is a charming, sorry, charming little church there is gone. Okay, so this is a nice tabula rasa here um, in which to build uh, some new housing. Great. So we're going to go iconic New York City style in honor of Robert Moses uh, with the uh, cruciform plan. Uh, so... Robert Moses was a big fan of what we call Towers in the Park, which was a modernist principle uh, whereby you build um, tall towers, uh, which house a lot of people, but then the ground plane uh, is left open for parks, which sounds amazing until you realize that in many places in the United States, uh, park turned into parking. Um, so you really had uh, these towers basically in... Uh, nothing but a big parking lot, and the result was sort of awful for everyone involved. Also, uh, the the story with these public housing uh, towers is that they were actually uh, designed. Um, I should make these red because it's sort of iconically red in in uh, New York City. Anyway, the 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 idea here was that they would house uh, middle class folks, um, but then uh, the federal government sort of refused to. Uh, budget enough money for maintenance uh, and then uh, they got really run down really fast and um, uh, middle income people didn't want to live there so what you ended up with in the United States was a lot of low income oftentimes um, black residents were stuck living in these places because their neighborhoods were demolished and um, they, were, they were really not a lot better than uh, what they moved, moved out of Though initially, when they were sort of promised uh, these new places, they were sort of hopeful that they would be sort of better units, but they oftentimes were not. And, and part of this was because the federal government believed that this was only supposed to be temporary housing. You know, in a lot of countries, like in Europe and, and like in Singapore, uh, you have public housing uh, is totally fine full, for full time for full time housing, right? People live in in uh, social housing, uh, and it's a very valid place to live. Here in the United States, it was seen as sort of a temporary situation until you could buy or rent housing on the private market. Uh, so they did all sorts of things to make you sort of uncomfortable living there. They had things like where elevators would only stop every few floors and you'd have to take the stairs anyway. Uh, and then they would do also do things like have um, closets that weren't even wide enough for, for hangers, which is just terrible. Uh, ooh, okay. I like the idea. If we build it near the freeway, do we get the the flat top, which I really would love to have a flat top to these. Uh, let's see. Oh, no. Nope. Nope. Okay. So let's, let's do that anyway. Okay, but these, these are coming along. I, I don't know how you feel, guys, but already I'm feeling good about, you know, this is, the, oops, this is starting to feel like an American city. I mean, as much as you can with Townscaper, uh, I'm pretty excited about this, right? Like, this vista here of just like the freeway and the and the, the cruciform towers of public housing, fantastic, fantastic. We are we are doing this. We're doing this right.
Oh, too close. Okay, but this star. I hate those star pieces. Okay. Maybe one last tower here. And I think we'll call that, you know, we'll call that a nice public housing project. Oops, too much. One more story. Okay. Okay. Look at this. Look at this. I love it. <laughs> it's so ugly. All right. So, nice. Another thing we got to do in terms of urban renewal is, um, you know, we got to do something about downtown too. So, you know, these, these little... These little shops down here are not cutting it, right? The, the city is, you know, it's they're, it's hemorrhaging business. The downtown business owners don't know what to do, right? So um, we have to take on uh, this area here along the waterfront, right? Property values are low. One nice, one thing that, you know, sort of one value uh, that uh, Urban Rio brought to the table was that it ha you know, it allowed public re uh, urban renewal agencies or sort of local agencies charged with dispersing federal funds for urban renewal to uh, use eminent domain, which was, you know, basically taking private land, as, as long as they provide just compensation, uh, and putting it to a public use. Um, and they could do it, uh, it'd do basically land assembly. So you'd have blocks, you know, filled, like like these blocks here filled with, you know, 15 different uh, property owners in, in small lots. And what they would do is they would, they would buy out all of the property owners, and then they would turn uh, 15 small lots into one large lot that a developer could then much more easily use. So, uh, so this is kind of our you know commercial center here. We're tearing that down, tearing it all down, um, because what we're going to do instead is uh, put in a, a gaudy performing art center. You know, all concrete, as brutalist as we can. Uh, we could get rid of this too, actually. Uh, it, followed by a few condo towers, you know, um, something, something, you know, to, you, you know. This is we're trying to keep true to Urban Renewal's housing roots here. Uh, so, uh, unlike the public housing, though, these are going to be sort of really nice high-end housing um, meant for upper-class folks, meant to sort of bring the upper class back into the the central city. Okay, so you know what was once the center of town. You know, remember. Uh, we had a nice town square with some charming buildings, but no more. Uh, we don't need that. What we need is, you know, just a real chonky. Uh, I, I gotta go gray. I gotta go gray. It's gotta be. It's gotta be a concrete behemoth, right? Okay. So you know, performing arts center. You would see in the in this time period. You know, cities would use uh, urban renewal funds to build. Uh, stadiums like the the you know the Houston Astrodome style like multi-use stadiums, they would build um, performing arts centers, convention centers. Okay, that that's sort of ugly. I think that's pretty ugly. And then we'll build a few kind of tall towers here too. Um, anyway, so they would do these sort of public projects to help. Oh, hospitals as well to stimulate private investment, right? Like, oh, if we build these really nice uh, amenities, um, private investment will follow. Oftentimes didn't happen. Sometimes you see like universities expanding as well into the central cities using urban funds. <laughs> All right, they should definitely be matching. Um, modernism is nothing if not brutally efficient. Okay, so let's This is awesome. I gotta say, also, just Townscaper is a pleasure. I mean, one of the reasons I did this video is I recommend that you check it out. I'm really, there's only really only one button is build, and then there's like, if you just press, like, if you right click, you just are sort of unbuilding. You either build something or unbuild it, and the, the software does the rest. And it's really cool. Ooh, <laughs> I like the, the uh, nice um, clotheslines in between the buildings. Okay, maybe one more tower here. I think I can fit it. Yes, yes, great. And I love that there's a space back here, which I can just now as a term assume is a sort of high-speed arterial street to carry all this traffic, uh, which will just further uh, disintegrate the the charming city. Okay, let's see. Oh yeah, oh yes, yes, this is great. I mean, I will say I'll leave this. So this marketplace here, 
is is the ideal location for what's called a festival marketplace, which really took off in the 70s, 80s, 90s. The idea that like, oh, we need to re revitalize our downtowns. So let's take like an old historic building here. Oh shoot, <laughs> an old historic building here and kind of revitalize it and bring it back to its former glory and bring people downtown as sort of a new way of, of urban revitalization. So we'll keep that. And we need to keep a cut enough places here to sort of make this uh, sort of gentrifiable later. But I think we've we've done a good job here of really of really destroying this city. We can go back to sort of making the suburbs even even more soul sucking, shall we? Okay, so I'm going to do a little cut and speed through the actual design of the suburbs here, me filling in the rest of the, the map. And while I'm doing that, I just wanted to say that I, I want to be clear that I'm not sort of anti-U.S. planning, and I don't want to make it seem like that I uh, revere European planning to such an extent that I don't see that there are any flaws there either. You know, this is just a video. It's for fun. Um, I love many U.S. cities, um, and I think that the U.S. city planners are working hard to undo some of the legacies that we're talking about in this video, like uh, rampant highway construction, urban renewal, suburbanization. So, uh, you know, it, it, this is just a, a fun way to sort of uh, push the limits of Townscaper while talking about some of the uh, mid-century planning policies in the U.S. that uh, we as planners today see as sort of uh, not best practices now. So. Uh, with that said, you can see here we're wrapping up the, the construction and filling into some of these suburbs. Uh, so let's get back to actual speed. Okay, now that we're done with our, uh, you know, montage of suburban construction, we can see here that we've done a pretty good job filling in the, the hinterlands here. And I want to talk a little bit about what's next. So we're, we're past the era of Robert Moses, which was about the 1920s to the 1960s. I would say we're, we're brought in the 1980s at this point. Um, you know, we've, we've really done a good job of filling in the hinterlands, but I want to talk about two phenomenon that typify suburban development in the United States that came a little bit later. And one is the edge city. Uh, you'll see these, uh, communities sort of often at highway interchanges, and I'm going to build one right here, in fact. Um, and it's, it's a place where there's more dense development, uh, maybe commercial development, office space. Uh, and the idea here is that, you know, putting them at a highway interchange, it makes it much easier for commuters to get there. Like Tyson's Corner in Virginia is an example of this. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to actually build some taller buildings um, over here. Uh, let's make it kind of bland, bland and corporate and build them up right near the highway here. So, you know, I mean, we don't need to make them too tall, uh, not as tall as downtown. But, you know, this idea here that this is a real job center. Let me make this one just taller. You know, this is a, this is a destination. Um, all right, let's build it off of, you know, you still need like your Denny's and your IHOPs right on the, right on the interchange there. And for, for these folks to go get breakfast and lunch when they're working. So let's do this. Another one here. There we go. Yeah. I know edge cities are a phenomenon I've been meaning to do a video on for a long time, so I got to get to that one. But they're really interesting, sort of, sort of nowhere places, <laughs> or like places where, uh, you know, they're mostly meant to, you're meant to drive in, work, and drive out, uh, and are not that exciting. See, also, like, <laughs> those like sort of nodes of like um, hotels that are sometimes along highway interchanges that I find to be also kind of soul sucking places to stay. Um, but yeah, so this is good. We got, we got ourselves like sort of an edge city here, sort of sprung up out of nowhere. I like that. Uh, the other thing I want to add to this to really finish it off, oh, wow, this is sort of beautifully mundane, is to add uh, exurban development. So Exurban development is the idea of really low density housing farther away from the central city. Um, and, uh, you know, it's very popular for folks who want to sort of feel like they're living amongst nature. Though I tend to feel like um, it really further spoils nature by being really land inefficient. So we're going to build some big old houses here. Um, let's see. Oops. 
some big houses just sort of really spaced far apart to sort of take up as much land as possible. These are the people buying like, you know, three acres, five acres of land. Where I grew up um, in the Midwest, like the dream was to always um, buy like 20 acres, 40 acres, and just like live by yourself in the middle of nowhere, which I think is, sounds awful. Uh, but th for those folks, uh, they sort of see it as like their, the chance to sort of live, live in nature, uh, but then you have to drive, you know, 30 miles to get to the gas station or the grocery store or something like that, which to me is just no fun at all. But, you know, we can keep this barn up here, which will sort of represent sort of the, uh, the rural character of this place here. But um, put some, you know, put some houses up willy nilly. Yeah. So these are some of our biggest houses. The farther out you go, the nicer they get. These are not entering suburbs uh, with their tiny little houses anymore. This is like the big, the big stuff, right? All right, let's see. Yep, I'm liking that. And a couple more just to really fill in this area here. I'm so excited now. Everyone knows how to build a U.S. style suburban development in Townscaper. I think I think I've achieved my mission here. I don't want to. Well, I should don't want to do my homework too soon. Not, the video's not quite over yet, but um, really proud of. Oops. Well, let's make that tower too. Really proud of how this turned out. Okay. Oof. There we go. We got some pretty roofs on that thing. Okay, maybe one more right here. Yeah, just like a little one here. Okay, and the only other thing, so we have this area here. And I, I've been sort of, I'm gonna fill it. This is, needs another house. What am I gonna do with this area over here? I think, you know, we got this charming town, we have the bypass. You know, it's, it's gonna succumb to development at some point. I think that we do need to put in some sort of neighborhood here, but maybe this is where we sort of think about sort of uh, you know the 21st century development here where you know there's the idea that maybe we should be we should be building denser again um, these days is not su not surprising to see uh, what we call uh, small lot single family homes um, you know so uh, houses that are on narrow lots to allow for more housing um, we are in a housing shortage at this point um, so uh, you know, communities are zoning for more housing so you know we have some of this stuff maybe let's do uh, another row of it over here yeah so you know this this uh, one small town here maybe this maybe there's a you know I you know I'm not, I'm not gonna put this in but maybe there's a commuter rail line that runs along here too right so this is, becomes a little bit more of a transit oriented development that would be nice right and uh you know, you know, there's a station over here. Maybe should we should we get some row houses in here? Even are we are we back to square one, where uh, we are sort of acknowledging that maybe uh, we should be thinking about having that level of density all over again, but this time out in the suburbs. Uh, so you can take your whoa, I don't know how I did that. So you can take your uh, train into the once beautiful city. Maybe so. Let's build a let's build a few row houses out here. This is also called missing middle housing in the uh, planner language, planner speak, uh, because uh, planners are really good at building um, uh, our sort of zoning for single family homes or for condos, but not really great for doing anything else in between, uh, but that's changing. So we're seeing more townhomes, accessory dwelling units or granny flats and backyards, things like that. So, all right, so we're getting a little bit more density in here, which I kind of like. Do we wanna do, um, Maybe some apartment buildings too, some like, you know, three or four floor kind of stuff that we sometimes see in the suburbs as well. See some more, you know, just density of, or sorry, uh, diversity of, of construction types. I think that's kind of nice. Especially here closer to the um, edge city, you know, have some more high density stuff. 
But you know, what's behind Etsy? We can maybe have an area here for some parks, you know, keep it nice. Um, and then, yeah, let's I think that was call that good. Let's leave a park over here too. So I think, I think we've done it. Let's, let's take a look at the handiwork here. So um, we have our central city um, bounded by a freeway that cuts through a low-income neighborhood and crosses along the waterfront, severing the city from the waterfront. Uh, the, I, I mentioned I, I based this green building on the ferry building, and uh, an earthquake actually destroyed the Embarcadero Freeway, which went right in front of the ferry building, and the city of San Francisco decided not to rebuild the freeway, but put a boulevard there to, instead, and reconnect San Francisco to its waterfront. So we can only hope that in the future, uh, you know, s smart uh, city leaders or an earthquake uh, takes down this freeway. Uh, but we have, you know, our performing arts center with condo towers as a part of urban renewal. We have our public housing cruciform buildings uh, tearing down slums uh, in its place. This used to be an entire low income neighborhood. Now there's only the smallest remains of which uh, are still here. Um, and then uh, our inner ring suburbs uh, with our small houses, our belt line. We got our sort of mid-range uh, suburbs, our shopping mall, our, our sort of highway uh, adjacent businesses, uh, sort of middle-sized homes, uh, and then we have our ex-urban area and our sort of higher density suburban housing. So I think we got most of it covered here in, a, in one Townscaper project. Um, you know, I think the, the thing to say about Townscaper is even though I did my best to make it look ugly, there's still a charm to it. So if you haven't checked out Townscaper, please do. It's just fun to play with. And I hope you enjoyed this uh, trip through the history of U.S. suburban planning from about 1920s to the 1990s and on into the 2000s uh, with an eye towards Robert Moses as well. Hey, thanks so much for sticking with me to the end of this video. It was about an hour long, so kudos to you. And if you made it this far, maybe you're interested in more of my content. And I post a lot of extra bonus content over on Nebula. I even post my next video there first. And in fact, you can watch my next video right now by signing up on Nebula. My next video is all about the history of Beverly Hills and how to plan for the uber wealthy. I think it's a really fascinating video and I know you'll love it. And you might be asking at this point, what is Nebula exactly? So. Nebula first just means that anytime you see a new video posted here on YouTube, it means my next video is already live on Nebula. It's like living in the future if you have Nebula. And it's one of the ways we try to add value to our subscribers. We love you guys, we love people who sign up, and we want to make the service better. And Nebula first is one of our ways of doing that. And if I can just say for a second that a lot of people ask me, you know, what's the best way to support this channel? And hands down, the best way is by signing up for Nebula. It helps me financially, but really it helps you too because you get access to all that bonus content. It's really a win-win and we designed it that way. So go check it out. So go click on the link on screen or in the description and get $20 off the annual subscription to Nebula and watch my next video. It's there right now. Thanks.